My name is Kate Grillo, and I'm an archaeologist. I'm interested in the history of cattle herding societies in Eastern Africa, and I've been excavating Neolithic sites associated with early herders for years. Uh, one other approach I've used to understanding the past is something called ethnoarchaeology. Ethnoarchaeology is the ethnographic study of modern communities and their ways of life, with archaeological questions in mind. For example, many scholars have studied the ways that modern hunter-gatherer communities, such as the San in southern Africa, go about their lives, how they hunt, how they collect plant foods, how they organize their society, and so forth. Archaeologists can then use this information to generate better hypotheses about what might or might not have happened in the past, when all humans were hunter-gatherers. Ethnoarchaeological research expands our frame of reference. When we're making analogies about past behavior, it helps to be able to say, here are the ways that modern peoples approach finding food, organizing their societies, etc. Now, would we expect things in the past to be similar or not? How might the past have been different? It's really important to emphasize that modern communities are in no way relics of the past. Ethnoarchaeology is most interesting, I think, when we're thinking about how and why things have changed. Now I'm going to present you with a case study. As I said, I'm interested in herding societies, also called pastoralist societies, who rely on domesticated livestock and are generally fairly mobile. They have to take their cattle and their sheep and their goats for both water and pasture pretty regularly. Archaeologists have long assumed that mobile people, like cattle herders, don't have things like pottery, because pots are heavy and they break, and why would you want to carry them around? It turns out, though, that on all of the archaeological sites associated with early pastoralists in Kenya, for example, there are tons of pieces of pottery. My research looks at what on earth they could have been doing with it. One problem is that very few people have ever studied pottery use by modern pastoralists, so that's why I decided to start the Samburu Ethnoarchaeological Project. I spent a year living with Samburu cattle herders in northern Kenya doing ethnography trying to understand how they make and use pottery, to better understand what might have been going on in the past. I'm not the first ethnoarchaeologist to work in Samburu. The famous scholar Ian Hodder, decades ago, used Samburu material culture as a case study to describe the ways in which ethnic boundaries, for example, are both reflected in and created by the designs of objects such as these necklaces and other types of personal adornment. Roy Larrick studied Samburu spears, a type of material culture whose style communicates information. The same could be said for these necklaces. Looking at them, I can tell you where these girls are from, if they're married, if they have any children, and so forth. But these previous studies, as important as they've been to archaeological theory as a whole, have very rarely been used to interpret the archaeological record of pastoralism, per se. Here are just a few pictures to show you what it looks like in Samburu. Samburu are very closely related culturally and historically to the Maasai, if you've heard about them. They are famously devoted to cattle. Sadly, when I was there, they were in the middle of a terrible drought, and most of their cattle had either died or had been moved across the country to better pasture. This shot of a cow hanging out in front of the Starbucks is one of the only pictures of livestock I have. You'll just have to take my word. They're really into cattle. It turns out that when they move, they put their pots in baskets and strap them to donkeys, which is what pastoralists all over East Africa do. So transport is really not that big a deal. What Samburu do use pots for is to help them during droughts. Typically, during rainy seasons, there's plenty of milk available from their cattle. When there's not enough milk because of drought, that's when they slaughter animals and boil the bones in pots. Pots are also used to cook blood from their cattle until it coagulates. It makes it less scary for children and also turns it into real food. There are also lots of seeds that are only palatable when boiled for a long time in pots. My argument is that it's not that Samburu have pottery despite the fact that they're mobile pastoralists. They have pottery because they're mobile pastoralists, and it helps them survive in really difficult environments. These types of information are really useful, I think, when thinking about why people might have used pots in the past. Was it to help with survival during droughts? 
Pottery is becoming less and less common in this part of the world. In many places, there's a very real stigma associated with being a potter. This is something that poor people do. As part of my work in Samburu, I helped to form a collective of women uh, called the Rapunye Pottery Group, who are trying to revive potting as a good way to generate income. Rapunye is a word they picked out. It means something big that's coming over the horizon towards you, like a thunderstorm or a herd of buffalo. I really like their group name. I hope that my ethno-archaeological research can help people in Samburu today, both by documenting an important part of their cultural heritage and by encouraging these sorts of projects. I hope you've learned that doing ethno-archaeology uh, can not only help us to better understand both the past and the present, but that it's also a whole lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs>